I call this the crime of our time because it is a crime that could happen to anybody. Invasion of privacy, trademark counterfeiting, cyber squatting. They only spent $10,000 doing all this. I can't believe that that's all it takes to ruin someone's reputation. It took four years, an eight-day jury trial, very expensive court case. We won a jury award for $55 million. Do you get 50 plus million dollars like that comes to you or your company? Well, it comes if you can collect it. <laughs> so that's the next battle. This is a ridiculous story. Yeah. <laughs> and so this is going to be a bit of a different episode of We Do Hard Things because one, I've got to get to know you a little bit better, but I want to spend time unpacking what the heck could take someone who is so well known in their industry, who has spent decades building a following, who has built up your brand and your products and you've invested in all of these different areas. What could take someone at what should be the peak of their career and bring them down to their knees, which is what it sounds like happened to you. Yeah, so, you know, it's interesting. I've uh, basically been an entrepreneur my whole life. I uh, never really had a real job. I mean, I had a couple of paper routes as a teenager. And I worked in a couple of small businesses my mom owned as a teenager. And I got my real estate license at age 19 in my first year of college because at age 16, I discovered a real estate guru who talked about buying real estate with no money down. And I thought being a real estate investor, that's the ultimate thing. And I think one of the most important things that we all need to look for in life is one simple word, leverage. We've got to get leverage. The way to get something done, the way to do more, the way to grow, the way to expand influence is all through leverage. And you know, a lot of your audience, they're using the technology that gives them leverage, right? They're taking their message and putting it out into the marketplace. And why I love income property as an investment is because it offers the most leverage, I believe, of any other asset class. So besides that, that's you know, as an investment side, but in terms of being a creative entrepreneur, a thought leader, an infopreneur, you know, you're using tools that provide leverage. Uh, the first book I ever published was way back over 20 years ago on personal branding. It's called Become the Brand of Choice. And by the way, last time I looked it up on Amazon, <laughs> it was selling, the paperback was selling for $60. So I was kind of <laughs> stoked about that. You're uh, like, it's out of print, right? <laughs> I know it's been out of print for years and it's selling for 60 bucks. <laughs> so I thought that was pretty great. Anyway, uh, but if you think about the history of influence influencers, if you will, right? And influencers go way back to the pharaohs in Egypt. Right? So, how so? What do you well, mean by King that? King Tut was an influencer. He had an audience and he influenced that audience to do things, right? The pharaohs did. And then it, it became, you know, thousands of years later became religious leaders. Joseph must have been a pretty good influencer. Yeah, right? yeah. But the point is that religious leaders were the big influencers of ancient times. Okay. And then it became businesses and politicians, right? Government and businesses took over from religion. And I'd say that the real turning point of that was the United States of America. In 1776, when the whole idea of separation of church and state really dealt a blow to religious leaders, if you will, and made it more about political leaders, right? And hopefully overall more about the people, we the people, right? But uh, then in the Industrial Revolution, it really became the businesses, the corporations that started to have all the power. And as far as personal brands, the big modern first personal brand, in my opinion, in the corporate world was Lee Iacocca when he turned around Chrysler in the 80s. OK, and so huge influencer. Right. And so if you see if you look at why, why not uh, Rockefeller, why not? Um, you know, uh, the original Morgans, you know, right. like what, the Mellons, like, you know, all of the robber barons, as they call them, of the Industrial Revolution. Certainly they were obviously influencers, but because they had monopolistic practices back then. And hey, we still have those, sadly, with these disgusting tech companies. Don't mention Google, Facebook and all of them and Amazon. But uh, they didn't need to be influencers. They didn't need to sort of step out in front of their company and like promote themselves the way Lee Iacocca did. OK, so I think there is a distinction there, but that's not the point. Don't worry about that. OK, let's not get stuck on it. The point is that as technology evolved, more influence 
dropped down to the individual level. So there was this huge power shift. And most of that power shift started to happen in the 80s, okay, in a real way. And what did we see in the 80s? We saw the power of information processing move from the mainframe computer to the desktop computer. And so now the power of processing took place on people's desktops, And that's only gotten better and better, obviously. Now it takes place in people's pockets, okay, with their phone. And so as that power shifted, it has given a lot of influence to really just the regular person. And that is a wonderful opportunity for people. Now, at the same time, it has given a lot of power to the detractors, because those detractors can use the same exact tools the influencers can use. And, uh, you know, Mark Twain had a saying, a lie can spread around the world before the truth can get its shoes on. Okay, and that's true, because as humans, we look for negativity, because our survivorship bias throughout all of our evolution was to look for problems, to look for negativity, because we lived in in an environment of threat and scarcity. So that's how we our brains were trained. And now we live in this environment of abundance and opportunity, and our brains haven't adjusted for that yet. So uh, what happened to me is I had this competitor uh, who was trying to just ruin my life. Okay. I mean, and they actually did a decent job of it. (laughs) And it took four years, but we finally took them to court. And uh, last September, uh, after an eight day jury trial, and a very expensive court case, uh, we won a jury award for $55 million against this competitor. There were six defendants, they actually hired a marketing agency, if you can believe it, an agency to ruin me, like they really did a lot of work on this. But one of the interesting things is that as part of the evidence that was presented in that trial and their testimony, they said that they only spent about $10,000 doing all this. So So they spent $10,000 to ruin you for four or five years. And we're going to go step by step through all of this because it's fascinating. But what ultimately arrived in a court case that awarded 50 plus million dollars in damages. Yeah, so here's the thing. The point I'm making is this. You know, I call this the crime of our time because it is a crime that could happen to anybody. You better listen to this because it really, it could happen to anybody. It could happen to your significant other. It could happen to your children, your parents. It can happen to anybody. It is so easy to do in today's era, in the information age. And so liken it to a hit and run accident or a drive-by shooting, right? It only takes a very little bit of effort, money, tools, whatever, to gain a bunch of leverage to ruin something. Think about it. You know, your whole life, right? All a a human life that has evolved and uh, invested and grown and maybe become very successful can be ruined with a drop of liquid. You know, it's amazing how imbalanced this is, right? So it's something that everybody needs to pay attention to because the most important thing any of us have is our reputation, right? And that's something that can be attacked by anybody at any time. And uh, it is something we all need to be very aware of. So that's Mm -hmm. in a nutshell, the story on the case. And I'm sure, you know, you want to talk about a lot of other stuff. But, you know, I do call that the crime of our time, because it's really important to understand. So let's go back. So what was happening? What year was it? What was happening in your business? What was Empowered Investor like when you kind of caught wind that something was up? Yeah, so I have several businesses, okay, and they didn't attack Empowered Investor. It was a different company of mine. And uh, basically, it was 2018. And uh, we were going great. You know, business was very good. One of my companies had just made the Inc. 5000 list. So we got all that recognition from, you know, being one of the top 5000 companies in America. And it was a great time. The company was growing. We had a big conference. Ron Paul, the presidential candidate, was one of our speakers. And it was a really good era. And then, you know, this competitor started basically throwing stones, okay, and trying to ruin our vendor relationship. And, you know, I had speaking engagements that were canceled and all kinds of uh, problems out. What were they doing though? Like they were like just 
calling people up and badmouthing you? <laughs> One of the things that I have really thought a lot about and in the court case, which, you know, consisted of tens of thousands of pages of documents. OK, we were very careful and I instructed our attorneys to be very careful not to give a how to manual. Oh, so, so this is like, we're not right. going to describe the power of a bomb. Yeah, I, I, I don't want to teach someone. I know how they did it and I know what they did. Right. But yeah. I don't want to like teach the world to do this yeah. because yeah, I don't yeah. think it's a good thing. Right. I don't think it should be done. So I don't want to go into like a ton of detail, but suffice it to say important relationships they were trying to damage them and they did damage many of them and you know they were successful so it's a very imbalanced thing i am very much a believer in freedom of speech and i do not like censorship i believe after the january 6th situation we saw tons of disgusting censorship by big tech companies and media organizations we saw it before that but it really sort of came to top of mind then. I remember I was put in Facebook jail for a while for making one little very innocent comment on someone's very inflammatory posting on Facebook. So I'm not in favor of any of that. The only thing I do want to say about it is, is that when you have different countries that have different laws about things, why is it that when you want to bring goods or products into the country from, say, China, OK, there's a process, customs, right? There's a customs department that makes sure that those products aren't bad. They're not containing drugs. There's no illegal stuff, you know, whatever. Right. So there's a process. But yet information can flow in from countries, other jurisdictions with different laws. Right. That have different legal systems that you may or may not be able to access or it will cost you an absolute fortune to access them. Why should that information be able to flow into our market without some checks and balances? That's an important thing. And I don't know the solution. I just know the problem. And that is a problem. Right. Okay. Right. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So we won't dig into what was happening, but when did it start to become real? And I'm curious because I've hung out with you a bit. What was your reaction? <laughs> yeah, well, I was in the middle of 2018. This became a very real problem. And uh, I just didn't know what to do about it because, of course, they were doing all this stuff anonymously. They were making online postings. They were sending emails. They were doing all kinds of uh, evil things. And I had a strong suspicion as to who was behind it. And uh, in the legal process, what you need to do to uncover some of these things, you need to file a lawsuit, right? That's the start of it. But what happens when you don't know who's doing it or you don't have proof? What you do is you file the case as a John Doe defendant. You basically go to the court and you say, look, we don't know who's doing this, but we want to find out. And we need to file this to enlist the subpoena power of the federal court system. And so we filed a John Doe case and then we had power because the court was behind us and the court will then allow you to serve subpoenas on all of these companies and they have to turn over documents and information. Right. But before that, the companies will basically just give you the finger and say, fuck you. We're not telling you anything, and, which right. is disgusting. Right. Like, right. how is it that people can do this stuff? without any accountability using fake email addresses. I mean, this case spanned all over the world. They were using vendors in Europe, in the Caribbean. It's kind of like they knew exactly what to do. It was amazing, really, how well thought out this whole thing was, right? And you have to hire lawyers, work through all the paperwork, get distracted from your business, get oh, yeah. distracted from everything you're doing. This is costing you so much in and for them, Time it's and money. just, yeah. Oh my and goodness. And agony <laughs> too. So, you know, look at a part of the reason I did this, Mark, was not just for myself. Okay. I did this because I believed to an extent I was a proxy for all the people who couldn't afford to do it, that didn't have the resources to do it. They didn't have the knowledge. They didn't have the time. They didn't have the, certainly didn't have the money because this case cost probably well over a million dollars. I mean, I don't know exactly what it cost because we had to hire so many investigators and so many things. And I don't think the other side thought I would actually follow through with it. And <laughs> right. you know, I'm a pretty darn persistent person. Okay. So I felt that I had to do this really almost as a, a charity mission, 
because knew there were tons of other people that the same thing has happened to that just couldn't afford to pursue it. And I could afford it. I had resources. I had money. Okay. I, I had to imagine, though, that even at the hardest times, knowing that you were not just doing this for yourself, that you were doing this to set precedent, you were doing this because this was a case unlike any other case, and that you were doing this perhaps for those who couldn't afford to take the time or the money to, to figure this out. I imagine that gave you a greater sense of purpose to get it, through those harder times, did. too. Though. Yeah, you're definitely right about that. No question. And that's one of the things that did kind of keep me going. You know, if you think about it, there are all these civil rights groups out there, and most of them nowadays are just rattling around without anything to do. Okay. And they're just kind of, you know, clogging up the legal system, frankly, with most of their stuff. I mean, some of it's legit, but a lot of it's just stupid. Okay. But, you know, there was a time when those civil rights groups really mattered and they were doing good work. And how do you do that good work? You do it through litigation. That's how the laws change. Okay. That's how when you set a precedent in a case, other future cases refer to that case and they use that as a basis of law. And so it's really important to do this kind of stuff if you have the resources to do it. So let me just tell you what happens with John Doe here, because that's an interesting part of it. We file the case against John Doe in federal court. And then guess what? We start serving subpoenas. John Doe finds out about the case. And oh, John, Doe, John Doe anonymously hires a law firm to defend the case, even though we don't know who they are. Can you believe that? So even John Doe can defend themselves anonymously. So John Doe hears about it yep. and hires a law firm anonymously. Yep. And then that lawyer from that law firm shows up or serves you guys to contest something without ever revealing yeah. who they're, right. who is, they can do. Isn't, that. isn't part of the law that you can like see Apparently not. Defendant or something? Yeah. Like, no, like it's, you have it's to know terrible. who they are? Yeah. So John Doe shows up to fight the subpoenas to try and make sure we don't have the power of the court to get the subpoenas and get the information. And they right. don't have to expose their identity, if you can believe that. So this law firm is fighting on behalf of John Doe and trying to fight every subpoena we serve. So we're serving subpoenas on internet service providers, on email providers, on all of these different vehicles that they're using. I mean, MailChimp, Constant Contact, those are companies you've heard of, right? Uh, you know, uh, various hosting companies, domain registrars, right? Uh, so we're serving these subpoenas and they're fighting them anonymously, right? Without so not even the companies that you're trying to get the data from. They're not fighting it. Some no. anonymous person is fighting them releasing the information to you to find out who they are. They're trying to quash our subpoenas. Uh -huh. yeah. Yeah. Uh -huh. So anyway, we go through all of this and John Doe is finally exposed. Was that a sweet moment or was that just like, well, what did that feel like? You know, I pretty much knew who it was. I mean, I had a very good, strong suspicion as to who it was, certainly, you know. Okay. Yeah. Mm. But there's a difference between what you think and what you can prove legally, right? So... You know, the standard, by the way, it's funny how, you know, you hear people talk about how America is so ridiculous. It's so litigious. You know, everybody sues for everything in America. You know, yada, we've all heard that stuff. And I don't know how to reconcile that. I'm not sure that's actually true because I know that like the standard of evidence and the standard of proof and the burden is actually really quite high. It's actually quite hard to sue somebody. It's, it's not easy to do. You know, you got to jump through a lot of hoops. You know, they the other side puts challenges up to try and stop you, you know, to try and get the thing kicked out. And uh, so it's, I don't think it's very easy to sue people, actually. <laughs> I think it's kind of tough. <laughs> you know? And so you now found out through all this investigation, how long did that take? Four years. It took the full four years. The case was four years long. No, it didn't take that long for John Doe to be exposed. I can't remember okay. exactly. But it took four years to litigate the case. And, you know, it was during COVID, so it kept getting postponed. And yeah. every time it's postponed, you just know that's, oh, there's another $100,000 we're going to have to spend because uh, the lawyers somehow figure out a way to keep billing you, even though they claim to be, like, ready for trial back then, and the thing gets kicked. And somehow, well... What, you said you were ready. Are you ready to go then? <laughs> Why don't you just stop billing me until we actually go? You know, but it just doesn't work that way, unfortunately. <laughs> yeah. And so when you shared this story, you talked about all the different government agencies that had to be involved. Yeah. Like, 
like how complex was this this was this web to unweave oh it was super complex yeah the other thing is uh, one of our assertions was that the other side actually committed a criminal act and uh, he lied to a police officer and uh, so we got the police officer, we deposed the police officer and got him to testify. And, uh, you know, that was a big part of the case. So the thing people really have to be careful of is that they're not, you know, they might be out to get someone, but they might also break a whole bunch of laws in doing that. Okay. And not just have civil liability, but they might actually have criminal liability. So it's pretty important that they... <laughs> You know, they be careful, you know, fight fair. <laughs> yeah. So you spoke about the fact that this was the hardest thing that you've had to face. Well, that, look, and I faced that, a lot of hard things. I mean, I could tell you other very difficult times in my life, but this was definitely right up there. Yeah. And so what was so defeating or what was so hard about it that it wasn't the type of thing like how could this personally affect you so greatly when it was just something kind of always simmering in the background well look i've been very careful to do things right and not take shortcuts in my life and to be a good person you know if, if i've got an unhappy customer i'm gonna take care of them i mean you know it's interesting in all these years in business and i'm in a litigious business real estate there's not a business without a massive amount of litigation. We've never been sued by a customer ever. Okay. And, uh, you know, if something is wrong, we're going to be there for our customer, right? We're not going to abandon them. We're going to take care of them and try to make them whole and solve their problems with them, you know, but uh, not all businesses, unfortunately, act that way. And so, uh, you know, that's, I don't know, did I answer your question? What was exactly the question? <laughs> I guess I'm trying to figure out like, how could this get to the point where you feel like, I don't want to say you felt like you take, to, wanted to take your life, but yeah. how could it get so bleak, so depressing, so hopeless? Well, it is because it was a very personal thing. Like what I meant about when I started to say not taking shortcuts, right? To do things right. Uh, you know, I took a lot of pride in that throughout my life that I didn't take shortcuts, that I was always ethical and I always did things right. You know, uh, saying everybody's happy with everything I did, but you know, I'm human. Okay. But you know, I, I just don't take the shortcut, right? And uh, and so I took a lot of uh, pride in that, you know, and I always maintained a very good reputation. And it was a real blow to have someone twisting and turning everything you say, you know, it was basically like running for office, like political office, right? You know, you're going to have your competitor just throw you through the mud. And it's like, it's just like the stuff that they just came up with was, it was truly unbelievable. Like there was no basis for it. I mean, it was just a complete like misinformation campaign, but it also shows you how people can like twist things around and just spin them a different way, you know, where there's like a little grain of truth in it, but they just blow it up into this ridiculous story. And, you know, it's a, it's what's called false light. Okay. Where it, you know, basically the conclusion they jump to is misleading to whoever's reading or hearing it. And so it goes through trial, eight days. What happens? What's revealed as you work through the trial? Oh, I got to tell you that it was so interesting. I mean, one thing I will say is that the whole process was super interesting. It, re it really was. I mean, as difficult as it was intellectually, it was very stimulating, actually. So I know that might sound weird to say, but, you know, the law is really a beautiful thing. It is built on all of these layers of thought by uh, layers of all the people that came before you and got in a dispute over this, that, or other the other thing. And all of this case law and all of these cases and all of this like thought that went into the law and the legal system. I mean, look, you know, law is the basis of civilization. Okay, you cannot have civilization without law. And so it's just really quite fascinating to see how it's built, you know, how the logic of it is built and how the system is uh, designed to, you know, the standards of proof and the standard you have to go through to provide evidence and so forth. It's really quite fascinating, actually. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I've always thought, you know, how strange it is that people talk about practicing law. Yeah. And it was only when I stopped watching all those crime shows where mm -hmm. I realized, you know, if you look at civil law or if you look at, at more complex cases, it's like, oh, each person is there to argue 
or present their point of view, their argument, and see if they can win the argument. It's more like this really, really complex debate almost yeah. more than anything else. Yeah. Yeah, it is. It's really quite fascinating. And, and you know, the way jurors are treated and, uh, you know, the way they're kept out of the courtroom at certain points because something can't come in, they can't hear it or see it. Uh, it's just a very fascinating thing. I mean, we had eight jurors and all eight of them were there the whole time. We didn't lose any jurors during the trial. And it's really six are required and then you have two backups. So, but all eight heard the case and they voted unanimously in our favor on all these different counts or causes of action that we had. And uh, they deliberated for about a day after they got the case. And it was really interesting to listen to the judge read what's called the jury instructions to them about, you know, it's sort of like a view it like a funnel as to way they're allowed to think about and evaluate the case. And that's just really, it's fascinating. I mean, you know, like, I, I think in life, we all really just need to appreciate all of the stuff our ancestors did for us. You know, I mean, it's we do not as humans tend to appreciate that. At least I don't enough. And I want to appreciate it more because like everything you have and do and every interaction throughout the day, some other person figured that out for you. I mean, that's truly yeah. amazing, you know, both living and dead, not just ancestors, but people alive, right? I mean, just look at all of the stuff we have and all of the conveniences we have and, and the fact that you can walk outside without getting attacked by barbarians, you know, unless you live in Chicago or Detroit or something, <laughs> uh, or New York City Ouch. or L.A. <laughs> or, <you know. laughs> so when I was in Europe, because because there's just so much history. Yeah. And I remember walking by this, this cathedral or this church or something that was made out of limestone. And I remember thinking, you know, looking at the date and thinking that piece of limestone that fits so perfectly into the foundation block that fits so tightly would have been uh, hand carved or oh, chiseled yeah. or whatever. But, but then the more that I actually learned about some of this stuff, like people would work like, like 40 or 50 years mm -hmm. and they would spend like a year and a half on one block. Oh, so that way that crazy. one block could go into this one thing. And the thing that they were building, they wouldn't even see the result of it in their lifetime. Yeah. It would take more than a lifetime to be able to see it. And I go yeah. like, holy smokes. Yeah, well, it's truly amazing. And you know, that actually is a good point that you're making there is the idea of, you know, when I was 17 years old, I had four great mentors and uh, Earl Nightingale, Dennis Whaley, Zig Ziglar, and Jim Rohn. I mean, just you couldn't have better mentors than those four. And I used to listen to their cassette tapes over and over again because I wanted to just train my mind for uh, philosophy and success. And, uh, and I didn't grow up with that. I didn't have any of that, right? I didn't have any of those examples. And one of the things Dennis Waitley used to talk about is he used to say, and by the way, Dennis Waitley has been on my show. I was fortunate to get to interview him on my podcast. And uh, he says, plant a shade tree under which you know you'll never sit. You know, do something that's going to live beyond you like a legacy, right? And, uh, you know, this case, to some extent, is that. How did they, you said 50-something million dollars? Yeah. How does a bunch of people trying to ruin stuff turn into a 50 million something dollar settlement or result? Well, you know, as you saw during my speech, I actually had the actual jury award document that the jury filled out in their handwriting. And there were a whole bunch of causes of action. So, you know, invasion of privacy, trademark counterfeiting, cyber squatting. You know, I did have the foresight years ago to trademark my name because my name was a valuable part of my business life. Right. And so, I also trademarked one of my main domain names, jasonhartman.com, and they used these things uh, illegally in their efforts to ruin me, right? And that was called trademark counterfeiting and invasion of privacy and uh, RICO, which is really interesting, which is racketeering. You know, these are the laws, R-I-C-O, it's Racketeer Influenced Corrupt Organizations Act is RICO. I think that's what that stands for. And um, the RICO laws, by the way, Rudy Giuliani, from what I understand, was very much behind, you know, this law coming about, I believe, in the early 70s, if I'm not mistaken. And RICO is what stopped the mafia in America. Because before RICO, you know, remember, the idea of this is called organized crime, right? There's lots of crime, but it's not organized. And so it gave the government a tool to attack 
organized crime. And basically, these people were organized. And so there's criminal RICO and civil RICO liability. And the jury awarded us that because they found that they were organized. They were doing this as a business, essentially. And there was also conspiracy. They were conspiring, right? And so uh, under RICO, it's automatic uh, trouble damages. And it's automatic attorney's fees awarded to the other side. Hmm. So I believe the jury award was for $3 million in RICO damages, but that's triple. It's $9 million. And then automatic attorney's fees. So there's a approximately another million, right? And so there were all of these causes of action that stacked together, added up to $55 million. Now, I need to tell you that some of these things, the judge considered them to be what's called duplicative so he kicked some out right after the trial. They filed motions and said, no, you can't have this. And so the judge did whittle that down to about $30 million plus interest, right? And so that's where it ended up. But it so, started. So do you get $30 million plus interest? Like that comes to you or your company? Well, it comes if you can collect it. <laughs> so that's the next battle. <laughs> yeah, you got it. You got to actually collect the money. I mean, this isn't a defendant is not Apple. Okay, so yeah. They're like they're going to write you a check for $30 million. Okay. They can just claim bankruptcy or just avoid no, payment. No, actually, just... the bankruptcy won't work because, yeah. and look, I do have to say, I'm not a lawyer. Yeah. Okay. No, no, so I, that, I'm clearly not a lawyer. <laughs> check with your lawyer for the real story. I'm just telling you what happened to me and what I understand from what my lawyers told me or our company's lawyers. And uh, an intentional tort is not dischargeable in bankruptcy. And RICO uh. is also not dischargeable in bankruptcy. So if you do something like you take your car and, you know, run someone over on purpose, you can't claim, oh, I'll just declare bankruptcy and I'm out of it, right? No, you can't do that, right? Thankfully, the law doesn't let you do that. So those are, you know, some of the issues. So they can't bankrupt out of it. So coming now on the other side of this with where you're at with, you know, maybe the money will come along or you'll have to try and get it down or what have you. But what have you learned from this and how did it change you? Oh, I just learned that, uh, I think I've expressed a lot of the things I've learned already. I mean, it's just, uh, it was a really difficult thing, but I felt like I just had to do it. And if it happened again, I would do it again. You know, would you have to? You can't let bullies get away with it. Okay. You can't, you know, if someone is taking advantage of you, what are the chances they're doing that to everybody else? Okay. You know, th this is, I, this is the price of admission. If you're going to be a successful person and, you know, you got to pay back the system for your success in some way, right? And, um, you know, this is just your duty, you know? They have a saying, noblesse oblige, which means nobility obligates, right? If you're in a position where you have the resources and, you know, this person is likely doing the same thing to other people or likely will do it to other people. I think it's your duty to do something about it and to stop them. I'll give you an example. This same defendant, in this case, did this to a former employee of theirs. They did the same thing to him and uh, he couldn't hold them accountable for it and didn't. So they, because they got away with it with him and maybe other people too, I don't know, you know, they did it to me. And if they would have gotten away with it with me, who knows would have been who would have been next, right? So you got to hold people accountable for bad deeds. It's just what you have to do. That's why we have a legal system, okay? This is the basis of civility. The government is not going to protect you from this. The government will simply offer you a system to protect yourself from this. And that same system, by proxy, by extension, protects other people, okay? I mean, think about it. There's a famous case... Ford Motor Company, okay? Back in the 70s, they designed a really ugly little car called the Pinto. You, you may have seen one of these in, on YouTube or something, okay? And don't depend on me for the, all the details to be right, but as I understand it, what happened is when this car was rear-ended, the gas tank blew up and people died. And so, of course, someone took Ford to court as they should. And what they discovered in the discovery process was that Ford literally on purpose made the decision to save about $1 per car on the gas cap of that car that could have prevented these deaths. Okay. So 
imagine if nobody ever took them to court. They'd still be making that car with that gas cap, saving $1 each, and people would still be dying. When I hear stories like this, it actually makes me not want to be popular, not want to be on social media, <laughs> not want to be a thought leader. Yeah. Like, I'd rather be good than famous. Yeah, right. <laughs> what is the lesson we should be, you know, you've been through this, you've learned a lot of lessons. What's the lesson that we should be taking away? That I guess bullies come along, you got to stand up for yourself. There's yeah. a legal system for a reason yeah. that it's not the government or even business's job to be moral. It's people's job to hold other people accountable, like with Ford Motor Company or what mm -hmm. have you. But um What's, I guess, your final words to us? What's your final advice to us? Well, I think it is a business's job to be moral and ethical. You know? And I think when a company isn't that way, you should call them out. I mean, they, you need to call them out. You need to do that. that that's part of the whole message. Uh, so a message is be careful in your affairs. The world is full of trickery. Okay. Obviously, you have to do that. And, uh, you know, I, I think we've we've kind of covered it. I don't know if I have a lot else to say about it, <laughs> so, you know, unfortunately. But, uh, but it is hard. It is expensive expensive. The system is not very accessible to most people. And uh, for the people out there that have the resources, when something like this happens or some other bad thing, you should do something about it. That's, you know, look at that's the way you should be giving back for the success you've achieved. I mean, that's uh, your duty. Jason, thank you so much. It, yeah. This wasn't your typical type of conversation, you know. Very unusual have, topic for a show, yeah. <laughs> I mean, listen, if you are any way into uh, investing, finance, uh, what's happening with the economy, afraid about inflation, afraid about what's going on with banks failing and what have you, if you are interested in that, which I actually am on the sidelines, You've given great presentations. You have an index where you look at uh, what's happening in terms of like, what are the true costs of things as yeah. opposed to relative costs over time. Right. You look through history. I mean, you're one of the most fascinating guys. I just can't talk to you about that stuff because I don't think I could keep up with you. Yeah. I wouldn't well, know what to ask you. <laughs> oh, you could definitely. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for all of that. But, you know, maybe actually since it affects everybody and what we've talked about doesn't affect everybody. Okay. But it might. Okay. What we just talked about for quite a long time that might affect everybody but this affects everybody what i'm about to say okay and you got to protect yourself and your family against this and it is inflation the devaluation mm. of your savings your stocks your bonds your investments and those things are getting relentlessly attacked or really i should say taxed because you know, we all think of taxes is you pay income tax, sales tax, whatever, all these taxes we have. We're all very aware of those things because they're obvious to us. But one that's not that obvious is what I call the inflation tax, right? And it is a tax. The way the government is taxing you is by devaluing your savings, your stocks, your bonds, your investments, right? The value of those things is going down. So in order to protect yourself, you want to have investments that hedge inflation very well, or even better than hedge them, they actually benefit from inflation. And I created a strategy called inflation induced debt destruction. I know that's a mouthful, inflation induced debt destruction. But basically, I'll just sum it up in a nutshell. And anybody listening probably is eligible to take advantage of this. Just think about this. This is why I love income property as an investment. Because when you buy an income property, you can rent that house out, you know, just a little single family home, you buy the property, you hopefully get a mortgage on the property. So you're only putting maybe 20% down. Actually, you know, it's the first time I saw this market in like, I don't know, 16 years or so, we actually now have a 100% financing deal for rental properties, if you can believe it. Mm. Nothing down, zero down. But that's mm. an unusual example. So I'm not going to go into that. Let's just say the typical thing is you put 20% down. So the bank pays for 80% of your deal. Right? That's great, right? We both love real estate. Okay. And uh, so you only put 20% of the money in and the 80% that you borrow when you, you borrow it based on the value of today's dollar. And as inflation occurs, and the likelihood is that we're going to have a lot more higher inflation in future years, meaning the value of that dollar will go down, right? So you actually pay the debt back in cheaper dollars, 
In future dollars. Yeah, the future yeah. dollars are worth less than the dollars today. Now, when I was a young kid, actually, uh, I had a mentor, if you will, that you're going to laugh probably, okay, that taught me about inflation. And it was a character on the cartoon Popeye, okay? And you might remember Popeye's sort of dopey fat friend was Wimpy. And okay. Wimpy, his famous saying was, I'll gladly pay you Tuesday for a cheeseburger today. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and, and so Wimpy understood this concept. It's called the time value of money. And so he got, he wanted the benefit of the burger today, but he wanted to pay for it later in cheaper dollars. That's inflation arbitrage. I've always... I've been aware of this from like my life insurance point of view, for example, yeah. you know, like, like when I got married at 23 and had a daughter, my wife's like, we need life insurance. You're yeah. an entrepreneur. And so I went out at the time and I don't know, whatever, got f half a million dollars of universal life insurance. Right. And I always knew that I'm paying every single month for the rest of my life for half a million dollars. But I also know that on average, at least this is what it used to be, on average, every 25 years, the value of something halves or something like that. And so I thought, well, if I'm lucky enough to live into my 80s or whatever, this half a million dollars would only actually be worth yeah, 75,000 right. or 125,000 based off of future dollars. Yeah. Uh, and so I know that somehow insurance companies are making money off that of one this. One of the main ways they are making money. Yeah, I'm yeah, just going to buying it that. today mm -hmm. and you're going to pay me this thing that I think is awesome, <laughs> but you're paying it like... 60 years from now. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Well, they might pay it sooner if you have an untimely well, death. Uh, hopefully but, but, 60 years from now. <laughs> yeah, but that's what their actuaries are figuring out, right? They pretty much know, you know, overall in the aggregate, how long people are going to live, right? And when that claim is going to happen. And so they're using the inflation arbitrage against you. So, you know, we want to use it in our favor. So arbitrage, that's an important word. It simply means like my layman definition of it is taking advantage of the differences of things, okay? You're exploiting a difference, right? That's an arbitrage. And so we want to borrow at today's dollars, pay back at tomorrow's dollars, but what if we could make it one better? What if we could delegate the responsibility of repayment to another party called a tenant? And we could say, hey, tenant, hey, renter, you pay my debt for me. And actually, you know what? Give me a little extra every month called positive cash flow. So pay my debt, give me a hundred bucks or 200 bucks a month extra, and I'll just stick that in my pocket, okay? And then give me all these great tax advantages because it's the most tax favored asset class in America. And it's really just this beautiful equation. And it really only works with a few things. Income property is one of them. But let me just tell you, you can see what all the bigwigs are doing on Wall Street with this same strategy. So you've heard, of course, you know, T. Boone Pickens and Carl Icahn and, you know, Ivan Bosky and right, you know, all of these corporate raiders, right? These big wigs. Okay. Well, what do they do? One of their main strategies is called the LBO or the leveraged buyout. Okay. Let me tell you exactly how that works. It's really quite simple. They find a company and they say, okay, this company, to buy it, we need a billion dollars. Okay, well, how are we going to get a billion dollars? Well, let's borrow a billion dollars. And then we're going to tell that company we're acquiring, okay, you cost a billion dollars, we got to borrow a billion dollars to buy you, but you're going to have to pay back the billion dollars. We're not going to pay it back. You pay it back, company. So they burden that company with the debt, and the company repays its own debt. Okay, and they get this leveraged buyout, okay? And it's called self-liquidating debt because on our rental properties, it's the exact same strategy. We buy the property and we tell the property to pay the debt, meaning the tenant, right? The cash flow from the property pays the debt and it's self-liquidating. I wouldn't like debt if I had to pay it. Okay, that is bad. If you have <laughs> yeah, to I know most it. people yeah. do. <laughs> <laughs> right? But the reason, Mark, I say it's my favorite four-letter word is because I don't pay my own debt, right? That the property pays the debt. The tenant pays the debt. And so 
you delegate that responsibility to the company in the leverage buyout example, the tenant in the real estate example, and it becomes self-liquidating. The debt pays itself, right? And then you get the advantage of inflation as well, inflation-induced debt destruction. So it's really just like this incredible strategy. You can't do this by buying gold or stocks or silver or Bitcoin or anything. Like it works with a leverage buyout if you're a big wig, right? Or it works on buying a little single family house. Yeah. That's why it's so accessible to so many people because probably anybody listening can buy a house and rent it out. And here's the real takeaway. You know, you started off by saying your favorite word is leverage. Uh, and I wrote that down because I realized that that is something I'm not good at. I'm just, I don't fully leverage my dollars. I don't fully leverage my investments. I don't, my team probably as well as I could. I'm just, when I've seen my greatest health increases is because I figure out something Tony Robbins style in my head to like, to like to pull that lever and have leverage. And I realized like you've given me something to walk away from, which is I have to learn not only just the principle of leverage, but but how to get better at making it happen, at, at getting uncomfortable or having that leverage over something so that way I can maximize it. Because I do so many things. And then honestly, it's just like, I only take it to 60% or 70%. Yeah. None of us is leveraging everything perfectly. I mean, I have you know, money sitting in the bank that's not being leveraged. And I hate it. I beat myself up over it all the time. You know, it's a, it's not a good place to keep your money, right? You could do much better than the bank. Okay. But look, uh, the mathematician of ancient times, Archimedes had this great quote. And he said, give me a lever long enough and a fulcrum on which to place it, and I will move the entire world. Because you can, I mean, we all know how the leverage works on a teeter-totter, for example, right? And so you can do anything with enough leverage. And so get leverage over yourself, your thoughts, your emotions, your investments, your properties, your business, you know, all of that kind of stuff. And the biggest leverage points I think available to us in today's world are simply buying some little single family homes, okay? leverage, right? You could buy condos and stuff too, but I don't like those as much. Like the deal would have to be a lot better for me to be interested in a condo. Okay. So single family homes and you finance them and then you rent them out and you're in a business where you have leverage, where like your audience, their thought leadership or creative businesses where they're taking their idea and instead of telling it to one person, they're telling it to a group of people and that is leverage. Okay, so just use those tools and that leverage. Oh, thank you. You just made me feel better. I'm great at leverage, apparently. You're doing it right now. We could be having this conversation where you're just talking to me and say you're trying to sell me something, right? You're selling one-on-one. Not nearly as much leverage as selling one-on-many. Where's the best place for people to follow up, find you, listen to your podcast, all that stuff? You can find my podcast and I've got a whole bunch of different podcasts actually, but my main podcast is called The Creating Wealth Show and it's on any podcast platform. Just type Jason Hartman and jasonhartman.com is my website that is trademarked by the way. <laughs> yeah, I have to mention that. And, uh, and then, you know, I'm on YouTube. Just look up Jason Hartman and you'll find me. 